Hello and welcome to Study the Word. This program is sponsored by the Kirkwood Church of Christ that meets at 948 South Geyer Road in Kirkwood, Missouri. We're glad you joined us, folks. In just a few moments, we're going to be dealing with this week's Bible question by one of our viewers that was sent in, and it centers around grace. In other words, the question is, They've often heard from TV, uh, past TV programs how that we are responsible for obeying the Lord. Um, but they want to know is, well, if we're saved by grace, how can there be conditions attached to grace since grace is a free gift? That is a really good question. We'll deal with that in just a few moments, folks. We're glad you joined us. You see that website there? You can see some of our past programs, that well, actually all of our past programs that we've uploaded to our website. You can check them out. You can check our times of services and our location because we would love to have you come and assemble with us. Now, if you have a Bible question on your mind, we'd love to hear from you, and we will use it on this program. And so you can uh, call it and leave it on voicemail or text it, and we'll deal with it on this program. And we're glad you've joined us. At the end of the program, we'll put that phone number up for a, for a longer time so you can take advantage of our free Bible study helps that we offer to everyone. All right, let's talk a little bit about the subject of grace. Grace, by definition, is simply something that is given that's unearned, unmerited. And so it's, it's a gift. Okay, and we, are, and we acknowledge that. In Romans chapter 5, for example, it mentions in verse 15 that, but the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And he was comparing himself to, to Adam in this text. Um, what Adam did and what Jesus did. And he was talking about the grace that was offered to man. The free gift of what? The free gift of eternal life. That's what we're talking about today. So we're going to be talking about God's grace. But the question at hand is, if we are required to do anything, doesn't that nullify God's grace? All right, so... Where do we begin? Um, probably over in Ephesians, the second chapter. This is usually the go-to passage that people go to by, by emphasizing we're saved by grace alone, which the Bible does not teach we're saved by grace only. It mentions over here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse, um, let's talk about verse, well, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So what you'll hear people talk about in pulpits across the land is that if, if you have to do anything to become a child of God, then you're nullifying God's grace. Well, that, that is not true. Um, the fact that there is going to be and there are conditions placed upon receiving grace, it doesn't remove the fact that it is a free gift. Now, some people say that that's just a contradiction. They're saying, Chuck, if you give a gift with conditions upon it, then it's really not a free gift. Why not? Can't, can't I give somebody a gift with conditions placed upon it? You know, if I have a will, <clears throat> and I say that to one of my grandchildren that, you you can get a, a new car when you reach 18 years old. That would be a condition I put in the will. Now, that's a gift. A car when you turn 18. Now, the fact that they had to wait till they're 18, does that nullify that it's a gift? Of course not. It's still a gift. And so what we're noticing here in this passage, for example, for by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. See, what's important here to understand is that the grace of God is extended to everybody. Okay, so when he talks about through faith, which we will probably spend the second half of today's program talking about, those conditions, 
I do want us to see that this free gift is offered to everyone. Now, let's look at a few passages that deal with this. The first passage we're going to look at is over in 1 John, the second chapter. 1 John, chapter 2. And he mentions in verse 1 and 2, he says, My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, we really want to stress that. I really want you to be thinking about that. This gift of grace, that's what grace is. It's a, it's a free gift. Who is it offered to? It is offered to everyone. This is why you have in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord's not willing that any should perish. Jesus came for the whole world. Um, this is why the commission was given in Mark 16 and verse 15, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel's for everybody. The messages that we preach here from week in and week out, it's, it's for you. It's for everybody. I don't have to sit here and assume, well, this isn't for you. It's just for somebody else, maybe. It's for all of us. We're all to learn these truths. And when it comes to grace, we need to realize that it's something that is not for just a few. It's offered for everybody. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, I want to read verse 14 and 15. It reads, for the love of Christ constrains us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Just reinforces the fact that Jesus died for everybody. And this gift is offered to the whole world, which is why we're going to all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. So where am I going with this? I'll tell you where I'm going with this. The fact remains that if this grace comes without conditions and it's offered to everybody, why isn't everybody going to be saved? Powerful question. One, one might say, well, Chuck, how do you know not everybody's going to be saved? Now, that's a good question. Jesus himself said not everybody's going to be saved. We read over in Matthew, the seventh chapter. Now, in the seventh chapter, Jesus actually gives us a couple of um, examples or instances that prove that not everybody is going to make it to heaven. That's what this gift is all about, eternal life. In Matthew chapter 7, he mentions in verse 13, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are a few who find it. Moving on down to verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. And notice what Jesus says what's going to happen on Judgment Day. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will depart, or excuse me, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And in the last verse of Matthew chapter 25, when these people will go off and suffer, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The point is, there are going to be many people that will miss heaven. Now, it's not because Jesus wants it that way. He wants everybody to go to heaven. He came and died for the whole world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus shed his blood for everybody. Jesus came and was unwilling, or rather doesn't want anybody to perish. So, this begs the question, if grace is something that doesn't have conditions attached to it in any way, then how come people are going to be lost? Now, people have come up with their own answer that's not from the Bible. They've come up with the solution by saying, well, Oh, well, Jesus' grace is limited. 
It's only, Jesus only offered that, that gift for people who will actually, you know, be saved. No. It, when you offer it to somebody, it's for everybody. And when you offer it to somebody and they don't receive it, whose fault is that? It's not the giver's fault. Versus, well, yeah, Chuck, it would be the giver's fault if they put conditions upon it. Well, but they have a right to put conditions upon it, and Jesus put conditions upon it. When we read over there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. He says, Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so somebody looks at that and they say, See, you don't have to do anything to receive that gift. Well, that just contradicted verse 8. What he was talking about in verse 9, not of works, that's the person who says, you know what? I don't need Jesus. I'm going to earn my salvation. I don't need him dying on the cross for me. I'm just going to work my way into heaven. Can't do it, folks. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, if you could work, you could boast that you earned heaven. No. But what did he say in verse 8 of Ephesians 2? He said, you're saved by grace through faith. Now, what kind of faith is that? See, James chapter 2 describes that. He says, there's such thing as a dead faith. Faith without works is dead. The Bible clearly tells us that what we are to do is we are to be obedient to the Lord. Now, when I notice in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, it reads, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Wait a second. Jesus talks about here, these are going to be punished with everlasting destruction when grace was offered to them? Couldn't have been unconditional. In other words, it couldn't have been without conditions. Let's put it that way. There were conditions attached to it. You had to obey. That's what it mentioned here in verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So you got to know God. And on those who have not obeyed the gospel. If you don't obey the Lord, then the grace is not going to um, benefit you. Yes, this, this gift is there. But again, it's with conditions. Now, here's, here's the key to all of this that we need to understand, is that the gift far outweighs anything that you and I could ever do. That's the point. That's why it's called grace, folks, that which we don't deserve. This, this is easily and clearly explained over in Luke, the 17th chapter. I'm going to turn over there quickly. Luke 17, and here's what he says in verse, Jesus says this in verse 10. Now, he's concluding his thought. It's just for the sake of time. I would encourage you to go back and read the first nine verses of Luke 17, but listen to verse 10. Jesus summarizes it by saying, so likewise, you, when you have done all, all those things which are commanded say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. So what the point is, when we have to do something, when we have to obey the Lord, first of all, in becoming a Christian and then remaining faithful to him. And I'll talk about those two things in just a moment. But when we talk about those things, you can't compare any of those things with what Jesus did. The gift of salvation far outweighs anything that we could ever do for our Lord. You've heard the expression, this is the least I could do. So when somebody does something great for you and you want to repay them or show your gratitude by doing something for them, uh, let's say somebody saved your life, which is good because we're talking about Jesus coming to save our spiritual life. But what if somebody saved your life? I mean, literally saved your life. And you did something for them. 
let's just say you gave them a ride. They needed a ride downtown. They saved your life before that. And they said, could, could you give me a ride downtown? And you give them a ride downtown. And they say, hey, I appreciate that. You're going to say, hey, it's the least I could do. And I'll tell you what you wouldn't say. You wouldn't say to the person, now we're even. You saved my life. I gave you a ride downtown. We're even. No way. Not, not, not even close. So whatever the Lord asks us to do, it's the least that we can do. Because the gift of salvation far outweighs anything that we could ever do. Now that's why he mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you reject the gift of Jesus Christ and your responsibility to obey him, if you remove Jesus from the picture and you want to earn your salvation, you can't do it. It, it. It's impossible because if you could earn it, then you could boast. Look what I've done. And there's no room for boasting when it comes to serving the Lord. He wants us to keep his commandments. That's what John tells us. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You do what I tell you to do. And when people who realized that they were lost in sin and heard about salvation being offered to them, you know what happened? When people heard about the gift, it's one thing to hear about the, the gift, you know, this grace. You can hear about grace, but do you want to receive that grace? Do you want to receive that gift? Well, let's see what happened. In Acts chapter 2, here are people hearing about what Jesus did for them. That he went to the cross and died for them. And in verse 37, it said, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and rest of the, rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What do you think Peter said to them? Dude, people, you don't have to do anything. Jesus did it all. He went to the cross and died. No recognizing the gift, it's, it's almost like if I have a, a, a case here with a million dollars in it, and I can keep telling you, I've got a million dollars here, I've got a million dollars here. Well, you're going to say, well, can I have it? And Or Chuck, are, are you offering it to me? Well, see, they were preaching about Jesus coming and dying so they can go to heaven. So he's telling them about this grace. And when they heard about this grace, they said, well, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, look what happened in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Well, wait a minute. Then You mean I got to repent and be baptized? You mean I got to do those things in order to have the remission of sins? I thought Jesus died and I automatically get my remission of sins. No. It comes with conditions. Grace comes with conditions. Of course it does, or else everybody goes to heaven. You want to know something? If grace didn't come with conditions, I don't even know why I'm teaching. Why am I preaching the word of God? Because I've read those verses. I know Jesus came to save everybody for their, from their sins. He wants everybody to go to heaven. But I also read not everybody will. And there's going to be a, a, a day of judgment that is going to come. And you read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to give account to the things that we've done, whether good or bad. And it went on to say, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We're trying to tell people to be prepared. They need to understand, and everybody needs to understand, that this wonderful gift, this wonderful grace that is being offered, needs to be received but it needs to be received on the Lord's terms. He has every right to put conditions upon that because of what he has done for us. So there's one example. And you can see time and time again, the responsibilities for people as far as obedience and needing to obey from the heart that form of doctrine. And you read about that in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, he mentions it in verse 17. He says, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered. And having been set free from sin, 
you became slaves of righteousness. There it is. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered. What was that? Well, it mentioned it up earlier in this chapter. You find that um, because of all this sin that was in the world, because of all the, the need that was in there, that made the gift or grace so, so large. And when people realized because there was so much sin, the grace of God just abounded because of that. And when people understood that, they misunderstood the application because when, when they realized because of sin, grace abounded, we find in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? And Paul says, Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Well, how do you die to sin? He says here in verse 3, do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So Christ died so that we could live. But you can't live until you put to death the old man. You need to rise up in newness of life. And we read what people need to believe who Jesus Christ is. They need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Yet, yeah, you have to do that. When people think that you're a Christian, just by just believing, no, that's not what the Bible says. How can you be a Christian and still be in your sins? We just read, they were told, repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. And we read in Romans chapter 6, you put to death, you have to crucify the old man. You can't be a new man before you crucify the old man. No, you crucify the old man. You put to death. You're buried with Christ and you rise up in newness of life. And this is where people are missing it because people are saying, no, 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 no. If anybody teaches that there are conditions attached to grace, they're a false teacher. I'm telling you that if somebody tells you that there are no conditions attached to grace, they're teaching you false doctrine, folks. Because you can turn right around then and say, well, is everybody going to heaven then? And they're going to say, well, no. Well, what? Because there are conditions. We must be obedient to the gospel. We read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do good things. We're supposed to. We're supposed to be laborers for the Lord. Remember what we read in, in Luke 17, 10. If we do all that's commanded us, we're still going to say we're unprofitable servants. We're just doing that, which is our duty. In other words, it's the least that we can do. God asked me to be a good husband. That's the least I can do. He died on the cross for me. God asked me to be a good parent. That's the least I can do. God asked me to be a, a good neighbor, a good citizen. He wants me to um, love those who hate me, uh, pray for those who spitefully use me. Why would I do that? Why would I go the extra mile? Because of what he did for me by going to the cross. When you minimize the wonderful gift, and then you start magnifying the works we do, then of course you're going to misunderstand. You need to magnify what Jesus did and realize that whatever he tells us to do is necessary, and it is a must, but it never puts on par with what Jesus did because we cannot earn our salvation, folks. We are to be so thankful for what he has done for us, and I hope this helps you understand God's grace, that gift that he is offering to you and to me. And it's discussed in this six lesson series. This home Bible study course that we offer, it talks about sin. It talks about grace. It talks about mercy. It talks about salvation. The church you read about in the Bible talks about heaven. You want to learn these basic fundamentals? 
go ahead and call in and leave your name and your address. I'll mail this first of six lessons. It's just two pages stapled, stapled together. It doesn't take long to go through it. I'll mail that first lesson to you tomorrow, and you work at it at your own speed and send it back with the return envelope we provide with a stamp already on it to make it easy for you. But you just need to open up your Bibles and do like this program is titled Study the Word. So please go ahead and request the, the correspondence course. We'll go ahead and put in there the pamphlets that people have been requesting. The 40 things that people think are not in the Bible, but they really are. Um, oh, no, no, that's the 40 things that are not in the Bible that people say they are. Mix that one up with the other pamphlet, and that is 30 things that people say are not in the Bible, but they really are. So those two pamphlets open up the eyes of so many things that are being taught today that are wrong, and so we want to encourage you to request those. And there's no charge for those things. We'll just put them in with your first lesson if you'd like. You can be put on the mailing list for our weekly bulletin. We'll mail it out every two weeks with two bulletins in there. And you can uh, have some short studies that we put in there, the short sermons on paper, if you will. And so go ahead and request that too. Also, finally, and that is face-to-face -face Bible study. If you'd like to get together and have a face-to-face -face Bible study, whether you're at your home, we can meet at the church building, the coffee shop, wherever you're most comfortable. We can meet with some of your friends, family, more the merrier. If you're a woman by yourself, well, we don't, I'm not going to show up just by myself. I'll bring somebody with me so you won't feel uncomfortable. And we can arrange it at a time that fits into your schedule during the week or on the weekends, uh, evening, afternoons, or even morning. So please keep that in mind because what's our goal? We want to help people to become familiar with what God has said because there's many false teachers that have gone out into the world as the scriptures teach in 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 1. And folks, if you're ever in the area, we'd love to have you come and visit with us. It was nice. We had a, a couple show up a couple weeks ago that had been watching the TV program, just wanted to come out and visit and say hi. Sure appreciate that. And folks, if you'd like to come by, Sunday mornings, 9.30 for a Bible study, 10.20, our worship service starts. And then we meet in the afternoon from 5 to 6 for an hour of worship and a midweek Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Classes for all age groups. Bring the whole family. We'd love to have you and we can study together. We won't make you feel uncomfortable. Uh, we're not looking for anything from you. On Sunday, we're not looking to solicit funds from you. Just come and observe. Join in in our worship. And we hope you'll come, and come by and say hi. Well, this has been brought to you by the Kirkwood Church of Christ. We want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and studying the word with us. We hope you'll tune in next week because we have another question that has come from one of our TV viewers. And what we're going to do together, we're going to open up our Bibles and we are going to study the word. Thank you, folks, and have yourselves a great day.